Okay, here's a video on chapter 6 when we are discussing government intervention. I'm going to discuss two different policies in this video. The first one is a tax and the second is a subsidy. And the thing that both of these policies have in common is they're both per unit charges or payments that are going to shift our demand and supply curves. We learned way back in chapter 3 that one of the six things that can shift demand and supply are a tax or a subsidy. So we'll talk about in this video why these policies might be implemented, how to graph and analyze their impact on price, quantity, consumer producer surplus, deadweight loss, what some of the pros and cons are of this policy, and then what does elasticity have to do uh, with their impact. So first, let's consider a tax. Uh, let's say it's a $4,000 tax on SUV consumers. And because it's on consumers, we know that it's going to directly shift the demand curve. Because it's $4,000, that will be the vertical amount of the shift. So anytime that you're drawing one of these graphs, the first thing you want to do is draw the market outcome. So this question would probably say something like, consider the relative elasticity of demand and supply when you draw the curves. We know our golden rules of tax is, it doesn't matter whether you put them on consumers or producers, all that matters is the relative steepness of the curves as far as who pays the majority of the tax or subsidy. So SUVs, I'm going to model as having a relatively inelastic supply. This is going to be the original supply curve before anything happens. That's because they require a pretty long lead on the production process. Once Ford or Chevy is locked into the amount of SUVs they're going to make that year, they probably order the parts long in advance. There's a lot of specialized components that take a long time to make that can only be made and used on an SUV. It's not like bread where if you order a bunch of flour and you don't end up needing it, you can use that flour to make a bunch of other things, right? If you have a bunch of tires or doors that are supposed to go on your Ford Explorer, you can't use those for many other purposes once they've been produced. And I'm going to model demand as being relatively elastic. And that's because an SUV is a large chunk of your budget there's quite a few substitutes. You could get a smaller vehicle, you could walk or bike or get a used car. A new SUV has a lot of substitutes and is a big chunk of your budget. Also a luxury good. So what the market would do on their own is this quantity and this price. Then the government comes in and does a tax. First thing we said we'd talk about was why. One of the big reasons that governments do taxes we now understand is to correct externalities. SUVs have a negative externality, so a tax doesn't have to be a Pigovian tax exactly equal to the amount of that externality, but any tax is going to move us towards the social outcome where we have less SUVs, which is optimal for society because of emissions, because of traffic, because people in an SUV are safe, but other people on the road are less safe because cars are more and more giant, etc. Um, it could also be that the government just wants to make, raise money, right? That's a cynical way of thinking about why they might implement a tax, but it's typically to correct some sort of market failure that will at least be part of their justification. Because this is paid to consumers, the first thing that we need to do is show demand going down. So I'm just going to do a parallel shift of the demand curve. The next thing we do is we look for where that new demand curve hits the old supply. That's our new equilibrium. So the first thing that the tax does is it decreases the quantity. It's one of the things we like about taxes and subsidies is we never get a shortage or a surplus. The quantity supplied is always equal to the quantity demanded. There's no SUVs sitting around unsold. The next thing we do is we look at that quantity, what the old demand curve is telling us. And these are the two prices that we care about. So that quantity hitting the supply curve, that quantity hitting the demand curve. The price up here is the new price that buyers are going to pay in the market. 
The one down here is the price that sellers will take home. And the difference between them is the amount of the tax. So if this is $4,000 and the market price were something like $35,000, this will not be $39,000, right? Buyers do not pay the full burden of this tax. Sellers are going to pay a share as well. Okay, so we know that the tax did two things to price. It made buyers pay more and sellers take home less. And there's some tax revenue for the government went up. It's the amount of this red rectangle because it's the $4,000 on the vertical axis multiplied by how many SUVs get bought and sold on the horizontal axis. Now, if the question asked you to describe changes in consumer and producer surplus using letters, that's when you would need to put letters in. So apologies, my graph is a little bit small, but I'm gonna try and label it with some letters. So A is going to be that area right there. B is going to be that area right there. It spans the entirety of this rectangle. C is this area right here. It's on both sides of that red demand curve. Remember, this is an artificial manipulation by the government. It doesn't tell us how much consumers actually value SUVs. So all of our letters can straddle that red line. D, E is the top part of that little triangle there, and F is the bottom part of that little triangle there. So now we're going to compare what was happening at the market equilibrium and what is happening now that there's a tax. Market is before, the tax is after the policy goes into place. At the market equilibrium, the black quantity and the black price, consumers were getting A, B, and E. Those are all the people that would have paid 50,000 for an SUV because they are wealthy or have a ton of kids or just really love um, Hummers and they only have to pay 35,000 like everyone else. Producer surplus was C, F, and D, this triangle here. Those are all the SUV manufacturers who have plants in developing countries or who have great deals on steel and they can produce SUVs for only 20,000 but they get to sell them for 35 like everyone else so they make some profit or producer surplus. The total surplus was A, B, C, D, E, and F. You always want it to be all the letters. After the tax, consumers price went up, right? The price of buyers is higher, which is the price that affects consumers. They are only making A. Producers price went down. The price for sellers is lower. So they only receive D. So consumers are worse off and producers are worse off as a result of the tax. In our list of consequences. But there is one player that is in the market now that there's a tax and who was not getting any well-being at the market equilibrium. The government makes B and C. And so the total amount of well-being in the market is A, B, C, D. That means that after the tax, two letters were destroyed. People were getting E and F before, now no one is getting them. That means that we have some deadweight loss by the amount of E and F. E and F are all of the mutually beneficial transactions that are destroyed by this policy. The buyers that would love to pay 36,000 for an SUV and people who could make it for 33,000 that now do not meet each other in the market to trade because they have to pay a $4,000 tax if they trade. And after that tax, it's no longer worth it for them to make that transaction. So in terms of pros and cons, things we like about this tax, if we believe there's a negative externality, it gets the job done and reduces the quantity of SUVs on the road. We don't really like the price effects because we think of buyers and sellers as actors whose well-being is important to us and they're both worse off. So that's a con, I would say. And then this inefficiency is also a con. It destroys some mutually beneficial transactions. Now that you know about 
uh, externalities though, you know that there was an existing dead weight loss in this graph already. So all of those extra units that the market was making that society did not value as much as they were costing society, those were a dead weight loss to begin with. So after this, we're basically just neutral. That's kind of a subtlety. And then it depends on your views on government, how you feel about this tax revenue going up. If you think the government will spend it wisely, this could be a pro. If you think that small government is better and people know what to do with their own money, this could be a con. So whenever you discuss the pros and cons of policies compared to each other, you just want to take that into account. Okay, so that's tax. Sorry that the graph ended up being so small. Let's talk about subsidy. So we did a tax where, oh sorry, I forgot to mention, the role of elasticity. Notice that in our graph, demand is relatively elastic. That means that C is bigger than B. Right? This area that is paid by the firms in the form of lower prices is bigger than this chunk that's paid by consumers on top. So out of all that tax revenue of B and C that's going to the government, firms pay more. Suppliers pay more because supply is relatively inelastic. So if we tax the SUV market and you buy my story about elasticity, that means SUV producers would be impacted more than SUV consumers. Essentially, these SUV consumers are so price sensitive, firms are not able to shift much of the tax burden onto them, or they will reduce their quantity demanded much more than the quantity supplied goes down. So that's a tax on SUV consumers. And I think I'll actually take a break and do the subsidy graph in a different video.